Thank you everyone for coming to our talk. We are going to talk about the work that Igalia does around the embedded devices and yeah, we are happy to be here in the Embedded Open Source Summit where yeah, we also have a booth that you can visit later if you're interested. So first, just a small introduction about us. I'm Manuel Rego from Igalia. I have been working on the last decade on different web browser engines like WebKit and Chromium mostly, also involved on Servo these days. And here with me is Mario. Hi, um, I'm Mario. I'm also been working for the past 10 years or so in web engines, in WebKit and Chromium mainly. Uh, also, well, for other years as well, in GNOME-related uh, projects and Linux-based operating systems. So, yeah, web engines as well, my hats. And I'm now overlooking the activities of our WebKit and WP team, so hopefully it'll be helpful. Yeah, so first about Tigalia, we are an open source consultancy that is highly specialized. Uh, we have people around the globe. We have been found like more than 20 years ago. So we have been doing open source work for quite a while. We have a special structure. We are a kind of cooperative like company with a flat structure and yeah, like spread all around the globe. I already said that. <laughs> anyway, one important thing about Igal is that we are the top contributors to Chromium, WebKit and Gecko outside of the, of the actual companies maintaining the projects. And we are very active in several different open source projects, like the different JavaScript engines too, LLVM, GStreamer, and a bunch of them. We will be going over all these during the talk. And we are members of a bunch of different standard groups in, in many areas of, of the, the stack. Okay, and about embedded devices these days, if you think about them for a while, you can see that many of them are web UIs. Like they are used for many different use cases, but many of them, if they have a display, they probably are using some kind of web UI on them. On the, on the multimedia side, there is the streamer project, which is quite important in many, in many of them, which provides things like hardware acceleration and, and other features. If we go a bit to the graphics layer, there is Wayland as a compositor, very popular on embedded industry, and then the RM or KMS directly, if you want to to the driver and then of course having a good graphics driver for your project and your product is, is very important that has the good performance for your device on the OS level Linux is like the main choice and the default choice and then there are even some new market emerging for embedded devices this uh, virtual reality and augmented reality that is quite relevant also for, for us. So, yeah, like, Igalia has an impact on, on many of these embedded devices through our, our work, and we have been doing work on many of different things. So here's a list, because, like, I mean, you can imagine now there are a lot of embedded devices, like smart TVs, smart home appliances, like cooking machines, audio systems or infotainment systems on cars, planes, things like that, GPS, I mean, there are many, many. Then these virtual reality headsets that are getting very popular, and even like digital sign up, like kiosk mode things and, and the like. So yeah, we are going to be going over the different things we have been talking initially, explaining the word that Igalia does on, on each of them. We'll be passing turns. So now it's Mario. Yeah, so yeah, you're stuck with me now. So um, for the web rendering engines, is one, like we said before, we are one of the top, well, the actual top contributors outside the maintainers of the main ones these days. So let's start talking about WP WebKit. Um, it's one of them, most, it's probably the one that is uh, being used mostly in embedded devices these days. So what is this first? So if you're not familiar, a quick introduction, WebKit is an open source web end rendering engine for desktop and embedded. It's the web engine that is behind very popular browsers these days, like on the Mac, iOS, Safari, but also on other environments in Linux, uh, Linux desktop and Linux devices. Um, it's, it's, I insist it's an engine because it's, a, it's not a full browser. This is something that, oh, sorry, uh, that you embed to create a browser, but not the browser itself. This is making funny yeah. noises anyway. So uh, for WP, what is that? It's a port of WebKit for embedded devices with a focus on everything you need on those little machines, right? Focus on flexibility, being secure, being performant, um, even if you don't have a lot of resources. Um, because of that, it's very important to get uh, hardware-based acceleration working and being able to integrate with specific requirements. 
Um, our main use case of these devices uh, using WP these days is multimedia, because it's very common, for instance, in set-top boxes. But it's also useful in other use cases, like server-side rendering is a thing, actually, uh, for, for different reasons, like for testing, for instance. So the relationship between Igali and WebKit is a long one as well. We started working to this project more than 15 years ago, and we are a very big contributor in it. Actually, we are the second committer to the project after Apple. Uh, we are also the lead developers of two WebKit ports. Uh, one is WP, like I mentioned before. We started that one from scratch in 2014. Um, and the other one is WebKit GTK, which is what powers um, browsers on GTK-based uh, environments, let's say, using the GTK toolkit. So besides that, we also do work at a higher level on the implementation of web standards, JavaScript features. Uh, we also do a lot of work in particular on the GStreamer-based stack of WP to integrate with different requirements of, of media pipelines in the two ports. We also implemented the accessibility support on Linux uh, from scratch on WebKit, and then we did a lot of things uh, like 32, support for 32-bit systems that is important for older devices performance improvement, bug fixing, and so on. And now, if we take everything together, we've embedded as well, Italia WebKit and embedded. So what this means is that we work a lot of development and maintenance of RDK-based set-top boxes, uh, which already cover a lot of devices in the world. We have been working on hardware-accelerated SVG uh, engine, a new one for WebKit that puts things into layers and makes everything more performant and uh, GPU-accelerated. Like I said, we work on backends for this streamer, uh, but in particular to support DRM environments like uh, MSE or EMA. Um, we implement, of course, custom backends for, for hardware, uh, for customers that they need it. And recently we started actually also experimenting with uh, Android, for WP running on Android. And we do a lot of maintenance for downstream forks. And before passing to Regoback, just, this is a demo of the new SVG engine, for instance. Um, you see it's giving 60 frames per second. What is interesting about this one is that it's putting different parts of the SVG into different layers uh, and sending all those layers to the GPU so that the GPU can do the compositing. And this is the reason why uh, it manages to be much more performant than the current version of the SVG engine that doesn't, doesn't do anything like that. It's all a single layer. So this has a lot of potential for desktop mm, machines, but also for... Uh, lower power devices. As you, you can check it actually in our booth if you want later. Okay, so continuing with the web rendering and choices you have for embedded devices, there is also Chromium. And yeah, of course, probably you, you all know Chromium, but anyway, it's an open source browser. It's not just the engine, it's the whole thing. You have the engine, but also the Chrome outside it. And it's available for different platforms, most of all the popular ones like Windows, Mac, Linux, or iOS. And it's the base for several other browsers. I mean, like Chrome is the main one, but also for Edge or for Opera and Samsung browser, I mean, for some kind of applications like Chrome Embedded Framework or Electron. It can be also used on embedded devices for particular use cases, like, for example, the automated Great Linux project, AGL, use, use it for the, for the, the UI. And then about Igalian Chromium, this is, again, a long relationship because we actually were working on reading WebKit before the Blink fork and all that, so it was kind of related. But, yeah, like, if we just talk about Chromium, yeah, 10 years of contribution with a lot of people in the community and getting integrated there. We are the lead developers of, of the Wayland, native Wayland support on Chromium, and we have implemented different web platform features, CSS Real Layout, MathML, some of the big ones, but many others, and JavaScript features in the in Chromium and, and V8. Then on the accessibility support side, not only on Linux, we have been improving and fixing issues with accessibility on Chromium in, in all the different platforms. And then, yeah, apart from that, we have been doing things like run performance, code health, refactoring, uh, generic bug fixing, and, and things like that. If we think about Igalia and, and embedded systems using Chromium, we have ported it to different uh, hardware platforms for different customers. We have deploying uh, Chromium web runtimes in things like smart TVs with WebOS, for example. We are active members of the Automotive Red Linux project where we are like, maintaining the, the Chromium layer there. And we also maintain downstream forks. Like sometimes people need the specific needs and they want to, to keep things, something like they cannot move upstream, but we can help them to keep downstream because Chromium is a big project and moves very fast 
and doing like the basis is a, a costly op operation. So here we have a, a, sm a small demo of this AGL project, like this is a Flutter application running on, on top of Chromium, and basically this is like a infotainment system for the car, basically like you have like the information about the speed or things like that. And yeah, basically this is using Chromium and we are uh, working on that. And then, yeah, like thinking on um, web rendering engines, Gali is also involved on Servo. Maybe you don't know about this one, but anyway, I will explain about it. So Servo aims to be a independent web rendering engine that can be modular and can be used for embedded devices. It's focused on speed and security. It has an API for embedders. It's cross-platform right now, uh, Linux, Mac, and, and Windows. And one particular thing about Servo that is quite relevant is that it's written in Rust. So it makes the only web rendering engine written in Rust somehow, like the other ones, like the popular ones are all C++. So it, that brings some nice features from the language that are very useful for, for Servo 2 that are like memory safety and, and concurrency. So a lot of things happen in parallel in Servo, which is not that common in, in other browser engines. Maybe you already know a little bit about Servo history, but just in case, this was started as a research and development effort by Mozilla back in 2012. There were, Igalia was involved a little bit during, during a, a few years on that period in collaboration with Mozilla, helping with different parts of the, of the engine. And then in 2020, like Mozilla stopped to work on Servo and they kind of transferred the project to Linux Foundation. And at that point, yeah, like the mission for the project was still the same that initially, initially nothing changed there, but the project was getting kind of a basic maintenance mode for a couple of years. There were no actual, a lot of activity there or anything like that. So this year, Igalia took over the maintenance of, of Servo, starting yeah, in, in January, and we have a, a roadmap for things we, we are working on, like upgrading the main dependencies that haven't been upgraded for this long period of inactive. Uh, like this uh, Stylo, Web Render, and, and the Spider Monkey, also working on improving the CSS test pass rate so we can render more web pages on it. And we have plans on the second part of the year to work on some experiments with embedded devices, how to embed servo in some applications, things like that, and also start to work on adding, adding Android support to the project. And yeah, about how this relates with embedded devices more directly, like. Maybe some of them just need a, a small, fast, and secure web view, and Servo can be one of these because it's a way smaller project than Chromium or WebKit, so if you just need something very simple and you have a control environment where you know which kind of widgets or web components you are going to render on the web, on, the, on your application, your web, web application, maybe Servo can be good enough for your needs and can be like something very simple to add. And then it's also a good, a good showcase for like advanced uh, web features and also a nice place for innovation in the way of how do you implement these new features looking for more parallel engines than in other engines and things like that. So things like WebGL, WebGPU or, or WebXR can be run on Servo and yeah, they can, you can try to make them like good there and, and can do them even faster than in others because it's a smaller project. And then like if we think in potential use cases, like if you have a kiosk mode application, you just have a control environment to render a particular application, that should be fine. Or some UI frameworks, for example, in Rust, there are a few popular ones that, that use a web view underneath. It will be nice for them to also use a, a web view that is written in, in Rust, like Servo. It's not really for general browsing, but it can be uh, good for, for other smaller cases. So now yeah, changing the topic to multimedia and graphics. Yeah, I mean, the, if you know Igalia for a while, you know that our history has been tied in the past years a lot to web engines and web browsers, but that's not the only thing we've been doing. So on the multimedia and graphics side of things, uh, we've also been doing uh, more and more work lately and getting more involved. Starting with the multimedia side, uh, this streamer is the main multimedia stack that we work with at Igalia for customers. 
So a quick introduction again, uh, Glitch Streamer. This streamer is a reference framework for Linux-based multimedia applications, not the only one. But it's, a, it's one that has provide, is providing a flexible architecture. It's a design based on pipelines and plugins. So the overall idea is you get like a source of information at some point, and then a sync, a destination of that information. In the middle, you, you can have different steps that process that information. You can demax or, uh, I don't know, process, encode, decode, uh, max again, all that things. So you put things in a pipeline. Um, in order to provide those operations, you can rely on the core base of GStreamer, but you, normally you, you will use one of the many plugins that they have that provide things like specific support for specific codecs, is, is an example of encoders, yeah, those kind of things. So because of this, it supports a lot of use cases. Uh, the usual ones are media players and web browsers, but even video editors for, for, yeah, for doing something like on, yeah, right, video editors, sorry, all that. <laughs> and streaming services, all those kind of things. Um, so our relationship with this streamer is also quite long, uh, more than 15 years again here. We have a, a strong experience in particular with uh, working with multimedia and embedded devices again, which is why we brought this up here. Uh, actually, in, if you focus on GStreamer in web engines, we are the top consultancy company there. I guess not surprisingly because of our work in WP and Chromium. Uh, but we are also actually the second contributor in general in the past five years in terms of, well, patch is not the great metric, but it's one we have. Um, then we are also the leaders of the development of um, GStreamer based vacancy in WebKit that provide different kinds of things, not just video playback, but also peer-to-peer -peer, uh, possibilities with WebRTC or, you know, adaptive streaming and this feature that you expect of applications like Netflix, like for media source, including media extension, those kind of things, DRM-based applications. Um, then we also did work around hardware acceleration, GStreamer VA uh, for Intel and AMD platforms and Vulkan elements for for Vulkan-based APIs. And last but not least, we've been also investing for a while on GStreamer editing services, which is a component that allows you to implement video editors like VTV, which we also contribute there. So the relationship of all this and, and how it impacts embedded devices. So um, the new GStreamer feature we've been developing upstream, both in the, in the core part and the plugins, uh, those are crucial for, crucial for, for the embedding industry and then many devices like set-top boxes or in-flight, in-vehicle, entertainment systems, those kind of things. Um, we do implementation of GStreamer backends not just for WebKit but for other web rendering engines. And this has a direct impact already in millions of devices. Just, if you just think of the million of set-top boxes out there uh, that are using RDK, uh, which is based on WP, that's already a lot. But there are even others not using RDK too. Um, because of this, uh, it's important for us improving performance for hardware accelerated solutions because they, again, this is, if you have a hardware which is low power, which is most embedded hardware these days, um, it's very important to make the most of the resources there. And, and then finally, uh, other impact we have is that we do integration with other libraries, so sometimes you, you just get your particular media processing unit and you want to integrate it in a streamer based package line, so we also did that for hardware. Um, and on the graphics side of things, um, about we work a lot on MISA as well. We have a graphics team working here uh, full time. Uh, what is MISA? Quick introduction again. It's an open source library, an open source implementation of the OpenGL and Vulkan APIs, uh, which includes drivers that you can communicate with different graphics cards. So graphics, I'm not talking about kernel graphics, drivers, I'm talking about higher level ones. Um, so what is OpenGL and Vulkan? You might say OpenGL, well, both of them are closed platform APIs. You can use to uh, implement 3D applications and uh, it exposes uh, the hardware of the GPU in some ways, which you can interact with. And it's developed by the Kronos group, uh, which Igali, I forgot to put it here, but um, is also a part of that group. So the relationship between Igali and MISA, uh, not as long as in web engines, but it's still fairly long, like nine years, more than nine years contributing to the project. Uh, we've been working on the development and maintenance of MISA drivers for, for OpenGL and Falcon, uh, aim at, you know, a different graphics card, different GPUs, as I said before. And we've also been doing work around conformance test suites. It's important that you, you have a driver that is not just correct, but also is complete. So we always work on expanding the API coverage whenever needed. Um, and now how this impacts embedded devices again? Um, well, the drivers development that we've been doing for OpenGL and Vulkan for different GPUs already had a huge impact, in particular in, in, in some very common devices like the Raspberry Pi. Uh, we work on the OpenGL and Vulkan drivers there, and in particular, uh, on, the, on the Raspberry Pi 4, we developed the Vulkan driver right, from scratch. Uh, started in about three years ago, two years and a half, 
and now it's Vulkan 1.2 conformant. We also work on other platforms as well. We also have demos there uh, in our booth for the Android phone of our uh, Vulkan and, and OpenGL driver, drivers based on MISA, which is the free Drino and the Turnip drivers, and for Vivant as well. So other things we do in, in the MISA side of things, we, we always want to enable like, hardware acceleration on all the devices, so at the graphics level, we also have to work on optimizing some pipelines. And again, we have to do work, integration work with underlying pipelines. Like Wayland is often the case, but sometimes we just go directly with DRM and KMS. Um, and yeah, and the last part, the last component I'm going to talk about before passing it to you, Drago, is about our work around operating systems. This is a very generic thing. So uh, it's like the, the final box where we put everything else. So we, in this case, we are talking about mainly the Linux kernel, which you all know what it is, but uh, just highlighting that is the most common kernel using embedded devices, and then other components like, you know, Windows systems, drivers, uh, sandboxing, uh, technologies, uh, desktop integration. So this, this basically covers like a, a wide, a, a very wide area. So what is our experience here? Um, we have more than 10 years working in the lower layers of the kernel, but even more experience uh, with distro-related work, like as Debian developers and maintainers. Uh, and actually we've been working maintaining packages in Debian in like the common architecture for a long while. We also are the maintainers of the RIS-5 port for Debian, which is still unofficial, but it's on its way to become an official port of Debian, fortunately, uh, in the next future, short future. Um, we are also the maintainers of the virtual KMS component, which is a KMS, uh, kind of KMS that virtu allows you to basically deal with, the, with machines that doesn't have a display attached, which is, again, useful for server-side stuff or for QA. Uh, you just want to emulate a display with a connector or a particular size or resolution. You use VKMS for that. We also contribute to the Linux kernel drivers for different GPUs. Again, this is not the MISA drivers. These are the ones at our lower level, so we also work there. And then we do a lot of distros, um, other customizations in distros, uh, improvements in power management, file systems. And this, many of these are in the context of our work on the Steam Deck, um, which we also have in the booth. So you're welcome to come there and I can talk a bit more about that. And then in our impact on, about this on embedded, <laughs> hard to summarize, uh, we picked just a few. So um, in particular around build systems, for instance, tools and framework, we do work a lot with Jocto and build root. We also do uh, work about Linux device drivers, not just for GPU. I mention in those all the time, but also other kind of cards as well. We work on the creation of Linux distributions as well and file system when needed, um, like a root FS file system, not just, you know, distro related stuff. It's not always about working on already existing distribution. And we do a lot of adaptation to specific requirements that, again, require, like, connecting different parts of the operating system. Um, and we, well, we also port software to a specific embedded operating systems, I guess. I'm saying operating systems a lot, but I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so yeah, like uh, this, um, this point is about the virtual reality and augmented reality. Like we mentioned, like Eagle is also involved on this area that is uh, kind of emerging these days. And we are basically, uh, we have this browser that is called Wolvik. And basically Wolvik is the open source uh, web browser for virtual reality. like. Some of the virtual reality headsets have their own browser, but if you look for an open source one, you will probably find only only Wolvik there. And it's not only a browser that you can browse the web, but you can also it supports also immersive experience like uh, WebXR, 360 videos, and things like that. Again, this was a project that started by Mozilla in 2018, and Igale took over maintenance of it and forked. I mean, it was Five Force Reality initially, and we forked it, and it's called Wolvik and we have been maintaining it since early uh, 2022. And the good thing now is that if you have one of these um, uh, virtual reality headsets, it's available in the app stores on most of them. So like the, the most popular ones, like the Meta Quest, Pico, or Huawei, the, you can just go to the app store and install Web Wolvik and give it a try and, and play with it. And it's supporting I mean, it doesn't support all the devices because uh, there are like kind of adaptations to each of them, but anyway, it supports more and more devices as, as time passes. So like if you have like the MetaQuest or Huawei glasses, Pico devices, it will work there and, and you can give a try. We also have a, a Pico device on the booth, so you can come pass by and, uh, and give it a try to Wolvik. And basically this is like how the uh, Wolvik UI looks like. 
is kind of a different than a regular browser. You are in an immersive environment, and you can see like uh, different three, like three windows in parallel. We are working to have even more flexibility here, but right now you have like three windows you can have in parallel, and you can interact with it, and you can enter inside WebXR uh, games or things like that inside the inside the browser directly. And okay, yeah, like now yeah, to the last point, <laughs> like to the last part of the of the presentation. Like we have been talking about the, all the work that Igalia does in different areas of the stack related with embedded devices, and yeah, we are going to talk here about how we see a little bit the, the future around around these technologies. So one clear thing is like open source is like totally attached to to embedded devices and embedded industry. Like it's used everywhere. There are big projects like the Linux kernel, like Chromium or WebKit, like very big projects that are uh, baseline for the the rest of things you develop on a, on a device and your applications. And there are big um, organizations that are contributing upstream. So that's very positive because you can innovate more, do more work, and there are many many actors collaborating together to improve to improve the solutions here. Then we see that yeah, the web platform is, is very relevant for embedded devices, like web engines are getting more and more important because they are used in the embedded devices a lot, not just as general web browsing, which is also used sometimes, but also for web-based UIs, like we, we talked before, like rich applications, things like that, that, that are using now web UIs instead of, of native widgets and things like that. There is a very nice thing about the web that is open developed. It has been there for quite a while, so it's quite well established. A lot of people know about it. It's always under continuous evolution, so new things are coming. And thanks to all the needs from the embedded devices, some new things related to this particular industry are also coming to the, the web platform. And yeah, there are some alternatives here, like having uh, WP, Servo, and, and other alternatives are bringing diversity to the web platform, which is uh, something very nice to have because like the ecosystem otherwise will become a bit uh, monolithic somehow. Yeah, and I mean, that's one thing, as we see, like open source and, and the web platform relevance, we see that. We also see that uh, our vision in the future and the not so distant future is that highly specialized expertise is always going to be a thing. Like, you know, embedded devices will keep having different sets of requirements, different specialized needs. We we'll always will require people with specialized knowledge and companies to, to be behind them and be able to work on that. Um, especially, we, you will always have a need as well to develop just new, new features, not just, you know, doing integrated work, but you need to want to provide different use cases, uh, support new hardware, uh, optimize things, and actually about optimization, performance optimization will be also key about all, across all the levels of the stack, not just the web platform or, or the graphics library. Basically, you want to optimize everything because you want your embedded device to work as, as well as possible and be as maintainable as possible and have the, you know, well, the longest life as possible, I guess. So with all this in mind, and just to wrap up, um, some final thoughts on, on how we see the situation, how we see our role in, in this complex puzzle that it is. Um, so let's start saying, um, it took a while to, to prepare this slide because it's a lot of things we try to convey here. Um, so first of all, we do see an explosion right now of the interconnected devices. I don't think it's a surprise when you can that basically connect your voice to a light bulb and a doorbell or whatever. So and this doesn't seem it's going to stop. It seems like it's going to be uh, growing more and more and more. So there is an explosion, and that explosion is probably going to explode a bit more. Um, at the same time, um, we also see uh, the existence of lower power and constrained devices. Uh, we think that's going to be a constant. I mean, obviously, um, constrained and lower power devices get become more powerful, but uh, for different reasons, I mean, from uh, like for budgeting reasons, cost reasons, scaling reasons, there are many reasons why those devices will always be as constrained as possible. So uh, this is the, this is one of the key things. So we don't think it's going to stop. We, no, we are not going to be using beefy machines in our in our wrist anytime soon. We don't think so. Um, and then um, there is this other th three parameter we wanted to bring up, which is uh, the environmental impact, um, not just for power efficiency or business reasons, just for kind of social responsibility. Uh, I think the entire society is moving towards a reduced carbon footprint situation, right? 
uh, and yeah, and so and that combined with also willing to extend the life of of devices, which uh, is not being great so far, but I think there are actually starting to be some regulations pushing also in that direction. So if you combine all these things together, uh, that kind of suggests that again, constraint and lower power devices are going to be here for a while. So yeah, just to finish this thing. Um, we see there is this kind of tension right between product features, hardware capabilities, and, and power management in, in that we'll always want our devices to do more, more and better. Uh, at the same time, uh, that's always going to happen in, in hardware that is always going to, going to have like a lot of limitations for different reasons, like I said before, budget, cost, scaling. And at the same time, we always want, well, I guess it all goes combined, uh, as lower power consumption as possible. If, if it's a portable device, you want more autonomy. If it's not a non-portable device, you still want not to consume a lot of energy if, if, if you can avoid it, right? So basically, there is this thing about doing more with less. So how this connects with the entire talk, uh, we were talking about how, uh, well, how we are driving innovation, how we are basically contributing to the embedded space using open source. So with all the experience we accumulated in the years and we started touching here and there and, and becoming key parts of different parts of the stack, uh, yeah, we think we are in a good position, uh, or we want to believe we are in a good position to keep contributing uh, to different parts of the, of the industry in the, in the near future. So we've been doing it, uh, I think, with more or less success in the, in the past few years. Um, I think now we are going to keep doing that. Um, yeah, basically these are kind of our main, let's say, I don't know how to say, pillars, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yes, and that's pretty much it. So. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. If you have any question, we can yeah, do a few comment. now. And then, otherwise, you can find us on the booth. It's in front of the help desk, just in the, in the third floor. So you will find us easily. So yeah, I don't know if people have Yeah, I don't know if you have questions. any question or comment or curiosity. Or people remotely, I don't know if they can ask questions somewhere or anything like that. It's become a kind of a historical speech in the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the question is if the, if the WP, the WebKit engine is using Wolvik itself. So the answer is not at the moment. Uh, Wolvik is a uh, fork of Firefox Reality when we took over maintainers from Mozilla. So it, it uses Gecko, and at the moment it still uses Gecko. But one of the main things we wanted to do is to decouple that and allow other web rendering engines. So one of the changes we've been working on in the past few months since we took over is revamping the architecture to allow different backends. So the expectation is that uh, we think the first backend probably we are going to try non-GECO is going to be Chromium. Uh, in the next few months, uh, we should have something working. Uh, and, and having WebKit, in particular WebKit with WP most likely, is also in the pipeline. But I, I wouldn't say this year, don't quote me on that. But uh, yeah, the plan is to allow to do that, yes. So, so why? why would you move to Chromium or WebKit instead of just sticking to GECO? Yeah. The question is why we, we would move to WebKit or Chromium if we already have Gecko. Well, I think that's a tricky question, but I think... I, uh, I, I can yeah. answer that one. <laughs> you Thank <are>. you, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, like there are different reasons, but one of them is like Mozilla has stopped it to maintain the WebXR stack on, on Gecko. So they, since they stopped working on the project, they are not doing anything there. Of course, we can start to do patches there, but they are like lagging behind features compared to Chromium and also performance uh, fixes and all that. So we want to give a try to Chromium, compare both, because we don't know if it's going to be better. It looks like in the first test it's way faster, but we don't know and also has some more features, so we want to give it a try. It's not like a make decision that we are going to switch and forget about Gecko or anything like that, but we have been like, making this work to have, like, avail, I mean, like have an architecture that allows different backends, and we can play with them and see maybe for some specific device, the needs of one is, are better than the other or things like that, so we can maybe have flexibility in the future. It is still to be seen <laughs> because it depends on, on different things that yet. Yeah. You're welcome. Any other comment or question? Yeah, yeah. Stefan? Or is that something you are not really 
So I'm not sure if I can summarize the question. So <laughs> no, because it all has to repeat the question. Yeah, sorry, for, for the, the, for the for remote people. So the, the, the question is it is about uh, whether we are just focused on Linux based uh, devices or and or other so I mean, if you go back to, to Yeah, yeah I, I we are back but somehow this is not working. No. Okay, so in your summary you mentioned that uh, you see like on No no just that is it. Um, but all the time you talk about embedded in the, in the talk was more about the Linux side of it, like how you would do the rest step and the end and stuff and so forth. But these kind of device types, I see more in the very constrained spaces yeah. in Arthos. And I was wondering if uh, Egalia is doing something in that space as well. So if you're looking at things like Zephyr, Fiatra, or oh, all right, right. not part of your like, plan. So, n n I mean, do you want to answer? <laughs> you can't repeat. <laughs> So, yeah, Maybe I mean, the question, you the, the question is whether we are just for those, those low power embedded devices, what Stefan is saying is like, there's not just, just uh, Linux based devices, but also devices with other much further constrained hardware and not even Linux, like more basic than that. And the question is whether Igalia is also looking into that or just focus on Linux, right? So right now, I think we can say that we are quite focused on Linux based operating systems for embedded devices. Maybe we haven't gotten uh, that lower in the stack. Um, so, yeah, that's, I guess that's, that's, that's the easy answer, really. But nothing is quite discarded. I mean, years ago, we, we, we were doing uh, GNOME work only, not web mm -hmm. engines, and now we are doing many other things. So, I don't know, but right now, it is not the case. More questions? Remote, is there any question remote? No? no. That can be good. <laughs> <laughs> or not <laughs> okay well thank you very much thank for you again, yeah. attending our talk thank you